Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The season of Lent is one big conflict with Satan. It's a series of small skirmishes leading up to the last battle on Good Friday. The devil had long picked his fight with man, tempting us to sin. And you heard his tempting toward our first parents in the Old Testament reading. The temptation that Jesus undergoes has much to do with righting the wrong of that event in Genesis chapter 3. The temptation of Jesus also has much to do with Israel's history in general, particularly Israel's years in the wilderness. In the wilderness, Israel was tempted to a great many sins, and committed a great many sins. They grumbled about not having any bread, they believed lies about the Lord, quarreled with Moses, tested God. After they had spied out the Promised Land, all but two of the spies brought back a bad report after those forty days of spying such that the people intended to set a different leader over them to replace Moses, who would lead them back to the land of Egypt, to the house of slaves. But the Lord said, According to the number of days in which you spied out the land, forty days, a year for each day, you shall bear your iniquity forty years, and you shall know my displeasure. Thus, that entire generation, save the two faithful spies, died in the wilderness, and their children inherited the Promised Land. But then Israel faced different temptations. Now they had abundance and plenty, and they gave in to the temptation to trust all their earthly possessions and turn away from the Lord and go after other gods. This whole history of God's people illustrates just how susceptible we are to temptation. And you're not make, made of any different flesh than they were. There are times when you're tempted and you sin without even realizing it. There are times when you realize very quickly after sin has followed temptation that you were being tempted and have sinned. But as proof of just how weak we are, there are even times you know you're being tempted as you're being tempted, and yet you're dragged along by temptation into sin in spite of your knowledge and awareness. St. Paul laments this very thing in Romans chapter 7. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. And again, a little later, he goes on. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. We are a weak. But our weakness is no excuse for sinning. God's law does not make any concessions for our flesh, but stands there carved in solid rock by the unchanging finger of God. The Lord does not give you a free pass just because you couldn't help yourself. The man blamed the woman, the woman blamed the serpent, and God punished all three of them. Because regardless of who tempted whom to do what, all three of them sinned. Yet even though God's commandments don't change, that doesn't mean the Lord isn't merciful. God is merciful. Amidst the punishments, he pronounced the complete overthrow of the devil and proclaimed a redeemer for mankind. The law didn't change, nor did the law's punishment. 
but an offspring of the woman would come and fulfill the law and bear the punishment and defeat the tempter. And thus, when we come to the temptation of Jesus, we are not coming to a self-help seminar, as if we merely lacked the right techniques for dealing with the devil and his temptation. No, when we come to the temptation of Jesus, we come as spectators to a great contest. We watch our champion fight for us and succeed where we have failed. In short, Jesus was not tempted in order to give you an example. Rather, Jesus was tempted in order to do battle for you, to defeat the devil for you, to overcome temptation for you. Let's now turn our attention to the contest. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. The Holy Spirit had just descended on Jesus in his baptism, which comes immediately before his temptation. And the first thing the Holy Spirit does is lead Jesus into temptation. This was according to the singular will of the triune God, and Jesus goes along with it willingly, and fights the temptation, and suffers the temptation, in order that he could teach us to pray and lead us not into temptation. And after fasting forty days and forty nights, he was hungry. The length of Jesus' fast corresponds to Israel's years in the wilderness. Jesus goes where Israel had gone and undergoes what they had undergone in order to replace his people's disobedience with his own righteousness. Through his fasting and abstaining from food, Jesus also restores what Adam and Eve had lost by their eating. This was in preparation for Jesus reopening the way to the tree of life by his crucifixion giving us to eat of its fruits in the sacrament of the altar. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. The devil tempts Jesus with food, just as he did with Adam and Eve, just as he did with Israel in the wilderness. And this remains a common temptation. In times when you lack some earthly thing, especially if it has to do with concern for your daily bread, the devil will come right along and begin his tempting, trying to get you to grumble against God or put your hope in earthly things. But Jesus has a proper understanding of hunger, which he knows to be true from Deuteronomy chapter 8, when Moses preached to the people of Israel. The Lord humbled you, and made you hunger, and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. When our bellies feel hungry, it's like they're saying, I need food, or I'm going to die. And yet, when our bellies don't receive the food that they think they so desperately need, what do you know? We keep right on living for quite some time without food. And this teaches us what true hunger is. True hunger is hunger for the Word of God, because that is the one thing needful. And we do not live by bread alone. The purpose of our Lenten fasting is really nothing other than seeing this verse from Deuteronomy. And as we feel those pangs of hunger, we're reminded that even without food, we continue alive because of the Word of God. And this excites true hunger for what is really needful. But getting back to the contest. The devil has wielded against Jesus a weapon that up to this point in time had never failed him. 
And yet with Jesus, he cannot land the blow. The devil swings, Jesus very nimbly steps aside. The devil stumbles, and Jesus sticks him with the dagger of God's word. The devil recovers himself, and he tries another tactic. Then the devil took him to the holy city, and set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. The devil quotes from Psalm 91, kind of. The words that he quotes are words that are in Psalm 91, but he leaves out a line. He will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. In all your ways means in your walks of life, in whatever places the Lord brings you as you go about your vocations. These verses from Psalm 91 do not mean what the devil would have them mean, that we can go looking for trouble and expect that we're going to be invincible, or that the Lord is bound to preserve us when we go out of our way to put him to the test. So the devil's words sound like God's words, and use God's words, but he has taken God's words and fashioned them into a deadly lie. The devil pulled this trick with Eve in the Garden of Eden. He did the same thing with Israel in the wilderness, and actually convinced them to believe that the Lord had brought them out of the land of Egypt only so that he could kill them in the wilderness. To this day, the devil does more damage with false teaching than with anything else. The devil loves it when congregations, for instance, claim to be non-denominational. Because all that really means is that at some point in time, there was a false teacher who convinced a bunch of people to believe that it's not worth fighting about the truth of God's word. But there are other things that are more important than God's word. And the devil is constantly tempting you to believe falsehood and to think that falsehood is the word of God. But Jesus combats the devil's lies with the actual word of God, which he proclaims to you. And through this preaching, Jesus continues the counterattack that he has launched on your behalf. Jesus said to him, again it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Israel had tested the Lord in the wilderness because they had followed the lies of the devil. And we're not guiltless in this either. But now Jesus substitutes his obedience for our disobedience. The devil charges at Jesus to thrust him from the pinnacle of the temple, and again, Jesus evades and sticks the devil in the side with the dagger of God's word and sends him hurtling down to the ground. The devil once more collects his wits and tries again with a third go. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give you, if you will fall down and worship me. The devil hadn't succeeded in tempting Jesus with lack. Now he tries tempting Jesus with abundance, as he tempted Israel to forsake the Lord after they had inherited the great plenty of the promised land. And the devil tries this same temptation with you as well, tempting you to trust in your possessions, as if you had no need for God, tempting you to become obsessed and preoccupied with the things of this world and forget about the Lord and the last day. But while the devil may have success with this against us, once more Jesus stands between us and the devil. 
Jesus begins his response by saying, Be gone, Satan. And we see in the next verse where it says, Then the devil left him, that this is quite a forceful blow. The devil must obey Jesus. Now Jesus had these words at his disposal the whole time. He could have commanded the devil to depart the second Satan had shown his ugly painted face. Yet out of love for us, Jesus chose to do full battle with the evil one. And it was only after disarming that Goliath that he vanquished him. Jesus then answers the temptation on our behalf. For it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. The devil then fled for his life, dropping his weapons there at Jesus' feet, and hurtling himself off that very high mountain in a panic. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. And yet the conflict isn't done. The devil made allies of the chief priests and elders and scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees. He bought himself an apostle, riled up a mob. Jesus was arrested and crucified. And as Jesus hung on the cross, the devil took up his tempting once more. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross, as it's recorded in Matthew chapter 27. But Jesus did not give in to the temptation. He stayed on the cross and wielded it as a weapon against sin and death and the devil and conquered in the fight. Now your sins are forgiven, and your death is dead, and the devil is powerless. All because Jesus has fought for you and has overcome temptation for you. Now to this day, the devil continues his tempting. Just as he targeted Jesus after Jesus was baptized, and questioned his identity, if you are the Son of God. In this same way, the devil focuses his temptations on you, who are baptized, and calls your baptismal identity into question. In fact, that's one of his sharpest temptations, when he tempts you to wonder, am I really a child of we also see that to this day, the devil has more than one trick up his sleeve. He tries one key to unlock your heart, and if that one doesn't work, he tries another and another, making every effort to lead you astray and bring you back to the land of Egypt, to the house of slaves. But the devil is a defeated <coughs> devil. Remember that when you're being tempted. The devil may be stronger than our frail flesh, almost everything in creation is, but the devil is not stronger than Christ, and Christ lives and continues to fight the devil for you. Jesus has emptied temptation of its power, because even if temptation does lead to sin, there stands Jesus with the forgiveness of sin. And Jesus also stands with you in the midst of temptation, combating the devil. As it says in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18, For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. And so when you feel the tempter's weapons, accusing your conscience and seeking to mislead you into false belief, despair, and other great shame and vice, Know that you are not against him alone, and invoke the name of Jesus. You can call upon the name of Jesus in prayer, asking him to give you aid in the midst of temptation. You can also call upon Jesus' name and invoke it against the devil, saying, In the name of Jesus, be gone, Satan. You can speak those words in the midst of temptation, and it's nothing else than hiding behind Christ and having him deal with the devil for you. And we saw what happened 
when Jesus told Satan to be gone, the devil had to leave. Throughout the season of Lent, we seek to mortify our flesh and resist temptation and guard against the evil one, and yet we'll find, as we do every Lent, that we'll not do these things as well as we ought or as well as we want. But our great hope that sustains us in the season of Lent and keeps us from growing weary is that Jesus has defeated the evil one for us. As it says in 1 John chapter 2, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. And he has. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding guards your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus.